This is Slam Hockey with your hosts, Peter Wojcicki and Paul Twinman. Welcome to Slam Hockey, folks. I'm your host, Peter Wojcicki. You can find me on Twitter at Russian98, and I am with... Paul Zwambag, you can find me at Zwambag, Z-W-A-M-B-A-G. How's it going, everybody? Peter, what's up? Uh, you know, hockey is going on. I love it. Some teams might be kicked out. Of course, the Flames, as we're recording this on Thursday, April 20th, the Flames are the first team eliminated with a sweep yeah. by the Ducks. I felt bad because it looked like Game 3. I don't know. The Flames maybe should have had that one. That one goal... Looked like it was a high stick. I don't know. It was iffy. So, you know, yeah, it, they, it just, they just didn't show up. Yeah, like Elliot wasn't very good. Goudreau was fairly invisible. I thought Kachuk was going to step up a little bit, but again, he's a rookie. Would can't put too much on his shoulders. But I thought I was going to see a little bit more out of him. But Monahan played pretty good. Yep, he uh, he was probably the only flame that played pretty good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It just sucks. Sucks for the Flames. Sucks for their fans. For Stieg was pretty good, too, eh? I don't know. For Stieg looked good. And that's not saying too much, right? When you don't expect a guy like for Stieg to be one of your best players. Yeah, so. and and we're 1-0 so far with our playoff picks. Yeah. We both we nailed both picked... Anaheim, yeah. Yeah, I think we both said Ducks in, like, five games, right? So... Yeah, I don't think we picked any sweeps. Uh, It's kind of tough to pick sweeps. Yeah, it is. You don't expect them to happen that easily. Um, Yeah. All right, well, what do we have this episode? We are going to be team ISOing the Toronto Maple Leafs with special guest Anthony Petrelli. Uh, We also have, of course, our playoff matchups talk, and we're going to be talking about a series we really like so far, maybe some underrated players, and a little bit of all the series. And uh, well, then we'll finish up with some Jablam Junior Hockey update. But first, trending now. A lot of things going on in the league, eh, Paul? Uh, but what I like to talk about is awards. And today they announced the Calder nominations. And they were Wierenski, Line, and Matthews. Who called this, Paul? Ne- neither of us. We got, we got a mixture. Oh, what did I call? I thought... You put Murray. Have... You put Murray third. Oh, yeah, that's right. I do I remember sure. you saying Wierenski fourth, but only, yeah. only top three, Peter. Only top three. Close, close. And you, what were your picks, Paul? Matthews, Murray, Wierenski. So, ah. Murray Murray got us on, on both sides. Yeah, I, but I told you that I did feel that the NHL wouldn't have picked him, right? Mm-hmm. Just, because he was there for the Penguins last year. I think that did hurt him with the Calder nom. And that's not fair to him, right? No, no because they look at Panarin. They they yeah. gave it to Panarin, no problem. So, I don't know. It's a little not fair, but... Ah, well. And, uh... So, we, I guess we're both thinking Matthew's probably going to win this, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, what was the... Uh, was there another nomination yesterday? Or what? Yeah, the uh, Selkie Trophy finalists were unveiled. Patrice Bergeron, Ryan Kessler, and Miku Koivu. Mm-hmm. And what did I say? Kessler, Koivu, and Bergeron. Nailed it. Boom! Boom! Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I think it was pretty easy to pick those ones. I think they were all... right. Like I said, I look at penalty killing, and I'm kind of surprised that the NHL was very identical with me because I usually pick guys that are more penalty killing guys, but all three work. They're very good players on five on five as well and put up a fair bit of points, but they're also very good penalty killers. So they all deserve the award. I had, I had um, Backlund as my number three and he, he had a pretty good first half and he kind of slowed down in the second half. So yeah, I can see why they, they put Berger on instead. Yeah. I think I saw something on Twitter. Some, uh, some flames fans were saying we should, we deserve three guys for the sulky or something like that. And it was like Backlund for a league and can't remember who else. Yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> All right, let's move on from the awards. Uh, we'll talk more about them probably next week as more will come out, right, Paul? Yeah, they're, every single day there's one going to be out. and mm-hmm. Yeah, so next week we'll we'll definitely have more to talk about. Yep. Uh, 
but for Canucks news and fans, they're probably not too happy about this, but it looks like Nikita Triamkin is going back to Russia. Uh, I think Philip Larson as well. Uh, but I, it sounded like uh, Nikita was not happy about his ice time. And he also kind of wants to go and play home, back home for him, right? So he signs a two-year contract you know, back with the KHL. Um, it sucks because he was one of the few bright spots for the Canucks season, I think, this year. A good young defenseman who plays fairly physical, and he has a bit of upside in all areas of the ice. So Yeah, not... I, I don't think it's going to hurt hurt them that much. Like I think mm-hmm. it would be nice for them to develop him in Vancouver, but by all means, develop him over at the KHL. It's not going to hurt his game playing in the KHL. Yeah. It's still playing against men, so... Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be that big of an effect. And when he comes back in a year or two, he is going to be developed. Like a, it's not going to stunt his development. So yeah. I think I think it's okay, and he's going to be happier being being in the KHL. So yeah, he'll but, get more ice time and everything. And look what happened with other guys, even the plate that went there and came back, like a Yager or even a Radulov as recently, and he's probably been the best forward for the Canadians. So, yeah, and it, that, yeah. it's going to open up the door for the Canucks for Ole Ulevi to maybe make the team, yep. Andre Padin, Jordan Subban, Guillaume Le- Brisebois. Like, there's a there's a lot of young talent in Vancouver, and maybe that that opens the door in training camp for for a good battle. So, mm-hmm. I I don't see a, an issue with it. Yeah, I think it might be actually a, a good thing uh, for the Canucks to get some more ice time for their other younger defensemen. Exactly, but. What's going on with the Sharks and Oilers series? Did you hear this story, Paul? That the Oilers go to San Jose for three and four, and both times they go for their team practice, I guess it was the day on their off day, and the lights are out. Like, what? Yeah, they, they left the lights off. I think it sounds kind of intentional, because it didn't happen just one time. It happened twice. But yeah. now, in, now in Edmonton, apparently, today... The Sharks go for their practice, and the ice is, like, wet. Like, there's many parts of the ice that are just very wet, and it's hard to skate through. So, I don't know. I don't like this. It seems like, to me, this isn't gamesmanship. I'd file a complaint if I was one of the, like, GMs of these teams. Especially, at least, the Oilers, because it happened to them first. But now it seems like they're getting back at them. I don't know. This isn't fair. You're not getting the best out of these players if if they can't even to a full practice. I I fault more the Sharks than the Oilers. The Oilers, it could just be, it, it could be a bad machine. Like the, yeah. the Zamboni could be junk, but, and it shouldn't be. Like by all means, and it might be the Zamboni guy being a, a jerk. But I think on the San Jose side, I think that's just, that's, that's the whole team. That's the whole building. Like how do you not know that the Oilers are supposed to be in the building and somebody go, oh, we have the lights off. Like, yeah, I think that's a little fishy. Yeah. Somebody at the SAP Center better get fired for this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. I don't like this kind of gamesmanship. They eh, can do something else, but this is, just seems a little wrong. All right. Uh, what else? Uh, Paul, you called it, I guess, right? The Sabres fired Tim Murray and Dan Bilesma. Yeah, we had the fire sale last week and. When we were coming up with the list before we went on air, before we recorded, I was like, oh, what about Tim Murray and Dan Bilesma? And you're like, no, it hasn't been announced yet. I think it's kind of rumored. I was like, what? I thought it was announced. So yeah. I had a, an omen a week a week too early. Mm-hmm. So, hey, a lot of other guys are being let go and fired. Uh, so I guess there's more openings here. But for the Sabres, I hear a lot of weird rumors. And they're talking about, like, ex-Sabres and stuff like that, like Phil Housley. Uh, Chris Drury. I've even heard like Bill Guerin's name. So it's crazy. I guess there's some guys like like a Dean Lombardi maybe being named to go there as a GM or whatever. But a lot of players as well. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, especially when you're rebuilding. You might want a more of a veteran coach. I don't know. It's it's tough. But I'm hearing especially a lot of players too, like even Craig Conroy. So I don't know. I don't know if. I've never been a big fan of players being a part of like, like even especially coaching roles. 
Well, that's that's the way the the league is going. Like, look at Doug Waite and Rob Blake mm-hmm. in the in the general manager spot, and Luke Robitaille in the president spot. Like, it's all ex players now, and I, I I agree. I'm not a big fan of it. There's there's guys that have been doing it for years and years and slugging through the mess of terrible hockey teams. Yeah. Where these vet players don't don't understand that. They don't understand the bad times. Yeah. The, the Pagulas have got something messed up going on in Buffalo. They I think they've been through like five different coaches. They've owned the teams the Sabres and the Bills for four or five years now and yeah. five different coaches and two different GMs for each. Like they they don't stick with it. And there was a tweet out from uh, all the Kings men podcast. We had him on the a podcast mm-hmm. when we team I showed the the Kings and he showed the first three seasons of Lombardi uh, being GM and they were awful. They were terrible and they stuck yeah. it out and he ended up winning a cup. Like there's going to be some bad times and the next group of guys that come in there, there's going to be tough times. Like they, they gotta, you gotta let them build. You gotta let them build a, a team. So hopefully they have a little more patience with whoever they bring in. Yeah. I, that's why I was telling you last week, I was shocked at the rumor. I think both Murray and Bilesma are, are solid at their jobs. You just have to give them some time. So very odd in my opinion. And uh, last but not least, did you see the Patrick Kane's new Gatorade commercial? I have seen it and boom is all I got to say. <laughs> boom. <laughs> all right. So again, as per usual, we will post this on Jablam hockey under game notes. All of our trending nows. We're going to post this Gatorade flow, uh, new commercial video with Patrick Kane, who apparently can score from like half the center of the ice easily because he drank some Gatorade flow. And I'm hoping he's drinking this tonight as they're on the brink of elimination against these Predators. I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. I think the Preds have got locked up. <laughs> um, is it just bad timing or what? Like, I hope with this commercial dropping like in the last few days that this will turn around the Hawks, uh, three nothing you know deficit in this series against the predators i don't know and to me it's bad timing but if they do come back i'm buying like a gallon of gatorade flow. Oh, i'm buying stocks and gatorade flow <laughs> I, I think what i think happened was they made the commercial sometime when patrick kane had some time off maybe yeah. in their their bye week and they didn't hit their deadline of playoff time because, you know, we're both in television. You know deadlines don't really get hit all the time. Yeah, yeah. And they missed it, and then they got finalized, and they probably argued over the next couple of days. They're like, oh, once once Chicago wins a game, we'll, we'll put it out and be like, this is why they won the game, Patrick Kane. Well, now they're down yeah. 3-0, and and they're like, we spent all this money. We, we have to put it out. Like, there's a <laughs> lot of money put into this commercial and a lot of time and effort and people's jobs, and we got to put it out. And they're like, well, this is the worst time. But, yep, we guess we have to let's try and hide it hide it underneath all the the playoff hockey stuff but yeah i think poor poor timing by gatorade all right time for this week's segment of team iso we are team isoing the toronto maple leafs this week oh yeah and of course it's where we talk more about detail about one specific team last year you got paul in my opinion this year we're going out there and getting better analysis and a better perspective and our guest this week is anthony petrelli you can follow him on Twitter at A Petrelli, A P E T R I E L L I. And Anthony is a writer at Maple Leaves Hot Stove. Welcome to the show, Anthony. Thanks for having me, guys. Perfect. Um, and again, we will tweet that out at Jablam Hockey and, of course, on our Twitters as well. So, how do you like how the kids are playing so far in this series versus the Caps? Depends which kids we talk about. I think <laughs> Matthews and Nylander have, have been everything you could pretty much ask for yeah. at their their phase. I've been writing about it a little bit throughout the playoffs. I, I think Marner has struggled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask I, about that later, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd like, I just, we don't have to get into it too much now, but yeah. I just, I really believe that the grind of the season, I've been beating it for a few weeks now, but he's, the only one of the kids that didn't play pro hockey last year. Yeah. It's, and, it's, it's, it's taking a toll on him a bit. Yeah. And I know you play a lot of games in junior, but it's not the same. 
you know, going to Sudbury and winning 8-2 on a Tuesday, it's just, it's not comparable to mm -hmm. the NHL grind. I think it's caught up to them a little bit. But the yeah. kids look good, generally speaking. Well, let's get into a little bit about then uh, Marner. Uh, he was the star that was stirring the drink on that line, right, with JVR and Bozak. They've had career years pretty much because of Marner, right? And now it's kind of the opposite where Bozak is kind of driving that line a little bit more and JVR chip, uh, chipping in and Marner's the third man on that line. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Like, uh, It's funny because Marner has four points in four games. Like, The stats look okay at the top. He's like yeah. he's the worst possession forward on the team mm -hmm. so far in the playoffs. Yeah. And it shows like he doesn't have legs. Like Bozak looks like a veteran mm -hmm. who realizes it's you don't get it that many kicks at the can. Yeah. And he's had some shifts where he looks like a man possessed. And then I, I think JVR has always been good in the playoffs. I mm -hmm. I've had my thoughts about him you know, during the regular season, yeah, particularly yeah. in the dog days of it. But yeah, on and off. Kudos to him because he's consistently I thought he was probably the Leafs second best player to Kessel in the in the Boston yeah. series. Yeah. And he was good for the Leafs down the stretch here. And I think he's been good so far too in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And speaking about other people that are kind of step it up in the playoffs, and I think the veterans on the back end have really stepped up. Like Polak did before he got injured. Uh, Hunwick has stepped up a little bit. And specifically, Jake Gardner. And did he not step up and play a little better last time too? Versus the yeah, Bruins, he, I think? He was fantastic against the yeah. Bruins. He was actually healthy scratch the first game of that series. Yeah. And then had five points in six games the rest of the way. And um, yeah, he looks awesome. Like when you play over 40 minutes in a game, you're doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, he just... He escapes danger. I, I think that's his, his big thing. Mm -hmm. He he beats four checks. He is able to break it out. I think him and Riley stand out a little bit more on the Leafs defense because the rest of them are Aren't pretty much, much that, and they're just yeah. not capable of making plays, right? Like, they're mm -hmm. getting the puck, and it's just off the glass. So then yeah. Gardner and Riley are consistently holding it, making something happen, even if they mess up once in a while. They're generally doing those things to push the puck forward cleanly to give them a chance to score. Yeah. You're always kind of wary with Jake and what he likes to do with the puck. I even think Babcock's mentioned it. Just let him do his own thing kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's odd because during the season, it, it's just like he has stretches where he's always making the wrong move. And then he has stretches where he's always making the right move. And I guess in the playoffs, it just comes together a little bit better, I guess. Yeah, maybe in the in the playoffs it's a little more intense and a little less time to like to freely think because you're yep. always just on the go and sometimes that happens. And you know, in the playoff or in the regular season when he usually gets makes a mistake, it, it's almost like his mind wanders or he gets mm -hmm. bored or something, and, <laughs> and and then tries to do something. You're like, what? Yeah, but not so much in the playoffs. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the other defenseman. Um. Why does it seem like Babcock's a little tentative to play Carrick uh, on the back end more? It just, I don't know. It just seems like his minutes have really dropped. And I think Carrick is trying to be a little bit more aggressive. And as the minutes go on in the playoffs, the refs aren't calling many penalties. So why not play Carrick a little bit more? I like Carrick. I've, I've wondered that myself. Uh, He's a good player. Like he makes things happen. He's surprisingly tough. Yeah. Uh, for his size, like he's always in there mixing it up with guys. I think, I do think a large part of it is, and you kind of alluded to it, is he just doesn't play any special teams whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And and you look, and his five on five ice time doesn't trail too too much behind. I mean, it does. Like he's just playing third pairing five on five minutes which is kind of what you'd have him as if you were yeah. to write out the lineup right but then the fact that he plays like zero special teams impacts yeah. his ice time significantly even if he was just mixing in shifts on the penalty kill uh similar to martin marinson you'd yeah. see it impact his ice time but he doesn't see any and 
I think that's the biggest thing. But yeah, once in a while you look and you see like the 13, 14 beside his name and you're like, you know, I think he could play four or five more minutes than that. Yeah. But. I, I'm hoping maybe in the future he might get some power play time because I still think he could, he has more of an offensive upside. But on the other side, then there's Zaitsev. He just hasn't really looked very good, especially the beginning of game three and four. Is it 100% maybe still from the concussion he's not he's not fully there? Or is it just like a week or two off from hockey? Or is it just playoffs and he's facing Ovechkin and Backstrom? What is it? I don't want to cop out and say it's a bit of everything, although I do think that's yeah. a large part of it. But I, I think a lot of it is, is just the injury return. Like he... Yeah. He doesn't look himself. He yeah. doesn't look comfortable. I think part of it is overrated is a strong word, but <laughs> uh, people probably think or at least thought at one point that he's better than, you know, he is. Like, he's a second-pairing D-man. Like, he's probably a, a number four, mm-hmm. if we're being honest. And he's yeah. playing on the top pairing. And he has Alex Ovechkin coming down his wing for the majority of the time, because he's on the right side. Ovechkin's playing his off wing. That's the guy he's primarily dealing with. Ovechkin's like, what, 250 pounds and still a beast. And Zaitsev's returning from a concussion and missed some time. Uh, He doesn't look as confident with the puck. Like he, the puck is not, he's not holding it anymore. Yeah. So I, hopefully, yeah, go ahead. if I was going to pick one thing, I'd say it's the injury, but I also think he's probably just maybe a little overmatched in that line mm-hmm. uh, line matchup as well. Yeah, his first foray into the postseason, and it's against the juggernaut that it is, the Capitals in their first line. Uh, so uh, you me- we mentioned Nylander and Matthews. Uh, what do you like specifically about their game so far in the playoffs? Two completely different styles, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matthews is just the full game. Like, I, Kuznetsov is a stud. And mm-hmm. he's he's going head-to-head against him. And I think he's coming out ahead so far. Oh, yeah. And yeah. and you don't you don't get by on that as a center if, if you're just good on either end of the ice. Like, you have to bring it all over the ice to do that. You can... Mm-hmm. You can kind of hide from certain things if you're on the wing, especially in the D zone. But when you're yeah. at center, there's nowhere to hide. So for Matthews, like he's bringing it all over the ice, I think. And I know some people, you know, even the broadcast has joked about some of the ways he's looked blocking shots and, and whatever. But I, I think that genuinely has an impact on the team when they see him. Like, we did not see him block shots like this during the regular season. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's gone out of his way more than a few times to put a body on guys, put his body on the puck, go through guys. He's got a bit of an edge to his game. Offensively, he's he's dynamic. Like, he scores every which way. Um, so him is just the all-around game going up against another elite player in the league. For Nylander... It, What's really impressed me is he's still able to hold on to the puck so much in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't think that he would be, you know, scared or back down or too soft. I I had a lot of people message me in the last month thinking he would be. I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't think that he'd play like that because I think he's an elite player. Um, But I wasn't sure how much he would struggle to find space. Usually talented guys take a few playoffs to have, you know, understand what they can and can't do in the puck with the puck. And they're playing, you know, one of the best teams in the league. And that's a quick learning curve. But the puck's always on stick. Yep. He's able to create something out of nothing. He gains the zone easily. It, he has a great shot. His speed is backing off guys. So it, just with the puck, he's been so impressive. Yeah. Somehow there's not much time and space, but he's still finding it so he's been pretty solid uh so that game last night was pretty wild uh did you think the Leafs were kind of down and out already again with the 2 nothing and the 3-1 leads no like <laughs> I thought I thought at 4-1 it yeah 
it might be done. But when they're only a goal away, they're they're so explosive that like you see, right? Like they've got they got a few bounces on those goals, and all of a sudden, like Washington knew. I I thought that was a poor challenge yeah. on on the Schmidt goal, mm-hmm. but yeah. I. I was also watching that and thinking to myself, like, Trotz knows. Like, he does not want these guys this close. Like, he was trying to get the three-goal lead back up. He knew that two wasn't safe. Yeah. And, you know, I kind of laughed when he challenged it. I didn't, again, I didn't think it was going to go through, but I thought that actually just spoke volumes to, you know, kind of what he thought of the Leafs. If if you've um, ever been in that situation before, and you think you're the better team, you kind of just shrug and go, that's ah, all right. We've still got <laughs> enough cushion here, but yeah, that was not the case there. Yeah, it was kind of weird, too, because the uh, the earlier goal, I I can't remember, but Babcock didn't challenge, and it looked like there was more goaltender contact there with the Capitals and Anderson, right? When, uh can't remember who went through the crease, right? Backstrom and, on the Oshie goal? yeah. That seemed like there was way more contact than the other one, and I would have challenged the first one first, more, way more than the second one. So it was very odd with how it went. So they got that goal, and then the Leafs kind of got the other goal, right? So I guess it kind of worked both ways. Yeah, um, I also I also feel like Babcock might have, like someone's got to start keeping track of this, but Babcock might have had the worst challenge percentage in the league this year. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it was pretty bad. So maybe that's in his head a little bit too. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Uh, but what'd you think about Anderson's game then last night? Uh, I think it's. I didn't think he was terrible, and I didn't think he was bad. Like, you can kind of look, and you're like, "Well, he scored five. Like, he's got to make a save." First goal is, you know, three guys to the net rebound. Ovechkin, one timer bomb. Um, even, uh, even the second Oshi goal, which I think was, um, uh, maybe questionable yeah. for a lot of Leaf fans. Yeah. Like, I think people forget Oshi is what the best one-on-one player goalie player in the league. Mm-hmm. Like the best, yeah. he's, he's the, the best shootout player in the league. Like if you were going to do a shootout right now, you need one shooter. He pulled every team. I think every team picks Oshi. I, I'd pick TJ Sochi for sure. Yeah. And you know what? Like, did he make Anderson look bad? Yeah, he did. Mm-hmm. But, like, he does it to everybody. Like, everyone knows it's coming, and he still does it. Yeah. So, that, I can't really fault him a ton. Like, I think he needs to, to play better, Anderson, than... You know, I I bet you he'd probably still want that game back. I bet you he'd still want large chunks of game one back. Yeah. Um, I think he'll need to be better to to advance. But also yeah. Holtby has like he's he's been better than Holtby so far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't I don't know if that's saying much, but he's been better than him. Paul, did you want to ask about any prospects? I I want to know who's who's left in the prospect cupboard, like. You guys have talked Matthews, Nylander, Marner. There's Brown, Zaitsev, Hyman, Levo, Kapanen. Is Soshnikov no longer a rookie this year? Who's who's left in that prospect cupboard? I think they actually do have a few interesting players to, to come, uh, a few guys to keep an eye on. So I'll just kind of go by, by draft in my head. Mm-hmm. And three of them are from last year, and it gets forgotten, but they had like – uh, I want to say 11 picks last year in the draft. Like they drafted a ton of guys. Yeah. So are there, you know, Nylander, Matthews, Marner in there? No, but when you throw enough to the wall, that's the game the Leafs are playing. And three guys kind of stick out early. The, uh, Yegor Korshkov, who's in the KHL, they drafted him last year in the second round. Um, it kind of raised some eyebrows at the time. Uh, he was a year older, and his numbers weren't uh, lights out by any means. But um, I was actually looking at it this week. So he had 19 points in 36 games in the KHL this year as a 20-year-old, mm-hmm. and he's 6'4". Oh. Um, and a few different models have that at around 
a third line production, a third line player, and the, it translating over to NHL. And hey, if the Leafs are drafting six, four players that can play in the top nine in the second round to go, you know, to just keep adding to that pipeline of guys that they have established uh, on the team. I think that's impressive. I think Adam Brooks is is another guy to keep an eye on. And I think both of the picks actually speak to a bit of a trend that's going on, not only with the Leafs, but with the league where, where teams are starting to draft uh, guys that are a year older. Uh, you get the extra year uh guys develop differently i think there's a bit of a market developing there and and brooks was another one that they drafted uh older and and then uh last year the year that they drafted him he had 120 points in 72 games and then this year he followed it up with 60 or with 130 and 66 and you know i think he's small i think you get two different schools of thoughts on him. I've seen some guys say this guy is going to walk right into the NHL and be a third line center to that. I'm a little skeptical to say the least. Uh, and then you have some who um, think, you know, he's on the smaller side and he's ripping up the dub and, but he's way older than everybody else. So it's not that impressive, but I, I think at minimum he's given himself a good, a good shot to be in the conversation and he's he's in an organization that is going to give him an opportunity to do it uh, as a young skilled or a small skilled guy i i don't think the leafs are going to get an, out of the way of uh, a player like that but I, you could probably think of a few off the top of your head that it would be much harder to crack their nhl team as a small as a small skilled player um and then a lot of leaf fans probably took a good a good look at um, Carl Grundstrom in the World Juniors this year, and you know he's another one that's he's playing in Europe, and I I don't think these guys across the pond get nearly the attention or uh, you know like if in the Swedish Elite League or and the KHL they're a little bit below the AHL, but every time we have a young kid that's like 19 playing in the in the AHL, we hear about it. Like Alex Nylander's in the A, we hear about it. Oh, like, you know, didn't have the greatest year, but, you know, people give him that benefit of the doubt. Like he's in the A, he's playing in a man's league. You know, he's learning to adjust, blah, blah, blah. But when all these kids do it across the pond, we don't, like they don't get that that headline or benefit of the doubt and, He's another one. Like he had 14 goals in 45 games in the Swedish Elite League in the top men's league, and he's 19. Yeah, he and does look pretty good. So those are three players off the top of my head. Obviously, Jeremy Bracco is another one. Uh, fans got a good look at in the World Juniors. I he's skilled, and I think skating will be his his issue. But if he can if he can keep up to the pace he's got the talents to, to play in the league. So he's got to work on the skating. And the other thing, and don't want to veer too much off topic, but so we saw Buffalo today fired yep. Murray and, and Bilsma. Yep. And they had three guys play. Uh, I saw someone tweet this. They had three guys that were 19 played in the AHL. Uh, Zemgis Gergensen. Risto Ristolainen, and now Alex Nylander. Yeah. And I'd argue all three of them haven't um, probably developed to the level that fans would be hoping so. I think Ristolainen has the, the nice point totals, so sometimes he gets just gets a, a pass at a, a cursory glance when people look and go, oh, he had 45 points this year. Yeah. But, you know, the over half of them came on the power play, and he has the most power play time on the team, so I, I think it's a little misleading. Um, but the larger point to that is the Leafs have a, a really good development program. Much better than it used to be, that's for sure. Well, yeah. well, and, All right. and they have the benefit of they have Matthews, Nylander, Marner, the, guy, the guys that are no longer going to be rookies next year, and they can take their time with all these Jeremy Brackos and the other guys you named, and like a Nikita Krostolev. Like they, they can 
let them brew and develop because there there's no rush for for talent anymore because Matthews Nylander Marner definitely fills those those voids yeah and if you do and the even more so when when they get to the to the team you know and Naz was honestly the one that had it the worst but it was like Mm -hmm. Kadri came up and there was not much going on on the NHL roster so every game was a lightning rod for him yeah yeah and now if if Matthews and, and Marner and Nylander and like you get a laugh and you're like writing about them every week and like a guy has a poor week. Like it took me like three games to be like, all right, Marner's not playing well. Yeah. To, but because I could just talk about Nylander and Matthews ripping it up. Like what, how can you even bother talking about Marner at that point? Because the other guys are just looking so good. Whereas when, when Naz did it, it, you know, he had a, a bad game or, or two. It was a whole mm-hmm. story. And all these yeah. guys are now just going to come in. Go, you know, go play on a line with Matthews for a few weeks. Go play on a line with Marner, with Nylander, whoever. It just makes their whole life so much easier. NHL facilities in the AHL, at least throwing a ton of money into development coaches, skills coaches, like the whole thing. So it's like the whole system just gives them such an advantage over other teams. So I hear what you're saying. They're, you know, probably not going to draft a, another Marner, Nylander, Matthews coming out of the draft in a long time. But they're going to draft all these other guys with skill and then they're just going to put their system to use. All right. Uh, before we go, Anthony, we will switch gears and go with those veterans. What do you think is the future with the Leafs and JBR and Bozek now, since the whole trend is going with the big three young kids. And I think it's, it's really interesting. I've debated it. I think the big thing is what do they want to do with Nylander next year? I think that's the starting point. And by that, of course, I mean, do, do they want him to, develop as a center because if Mm -hmm. they do then i don't see how you can keep bozak or are they happy with with nylander and matthews together which they look awesome right now and do they just want to keep that train rolling and say you know what like let's just play like two high-end players together and let them run up this league and and babcock did that for a while with sutterberg and dadsuk he taught todd mcclellan that who then went to san jose and did it with marlo and thornton so i could see him doing that like, it's hard mm-hmm. to watch them right now and be like, yeah, I want to break those guys up next year. But if they do want Nylander to develop as a center, then I think you kind of got to move Bozak. But if not, I like, are they going to find a better center Would than you... Bozak at that money? Probably not, right? So in, in that case, you'd keep him. But I think JVR, I don't see how they'd keep him unless they think they can go really far next year and they just want to keep a good player and say, we don't care. If I was them, I'd probably claim... Marinson off yep. the Leafs just looking at it like relatively young defenseman cheap can take a shift I'd be claiming as many defensemen as I can if I was them and centers and then just go from there all right well uh that's it uh, Anthony thanks for coming on the show again we're gonna tweet uh, out uh your Twitter account at a Petrelli on Twitter and uh, thank you for coming on the show again Anthony thanks for having me guys playoff matchups Paul all right what are your picks for best series so far? Who's your number three? We, we have a top three list. Number three. I'm going to go, uh, I think, Edmonton-San Jose. The last game, it was a throwout. It, you could see it was just going to be a blowout, and the Oilers didn't show up for it. But I, I think it's probably the best late-night series. Like, Anaheim-Calgary was no fun to watch. The Calgary did not look mm. like they even wanted to be there. But I'm going to yeah. go with the Oilers and, and Sharks as the, the number three pick. Yeah, my number two was uh, the Sharks and Oilers. It's been a great series. Uh, yeah, the last game was a blowout. Oilers weren't even in from it from day one. But the good thing is it's showing that we know there is that explosive offense and experience that the Sharks haven't really shown yet. And it did in game four. And we'll see more of it tonight, right? Uh, so, the, yeah, but the series has been great. All The first three games were so tight. Uh, both goaltenders are playing well, especially Talbot. Um, and we haven't seen enough of McDavid yet so far. They're doing a pretty good job on covering him. And he's getting pretty feisty, too. He's having a bit of that early Crosby thing in the playoffs, right? Where he's getting annoyed at all the contact he's getting and it's maybe taking him off his game a bit, but I'm surprised the Oilers, like even second line, especially again, like the first two, three games 
they've been pretty good. Uh, RNH, uh, Lucic, and of course Jordan Emberley. He's been st- he's looked pretty good. Um, so it's it's been a good series, and of course, uh, the further the series goes, Thornton and Couture are looking better, and of course Burns is amazing. Yeah, in, Burns, as well Burns as in that seven nothing. He was just that was his kind of game. He he yeah. loved it out there. <laughs> Him and Pavelski are playing very well for the Sharks. Um, all right. And my number three is the Habs and Rangers series. And we both mentioned – sorry? Interesting that, that the, you're a fan of a goalie duel. Yeah. You know, it's still it's still playoff hockey. If you're watching this series, it's so feisty. Every game is down to one goal. I think we're – as we're recording this, I think they're going to the playoff uh, overtime right now in game five here uh but every game is so close I, yes there's so few goals but the goaltending is just exceptional how many big saves are price and lungfist making not only on the first shot but the second and the third opportunities as well oh my goodness there's you could just make the top 10 highlights of the playoffs and just have lungfist and price and their saves they've been outstanding yeah, one one is they're both wanting to to get to the big dance, and one's at kind of his peak performance, and the other one's kind of on the tail end of his of his career. So it it's two guys that really want really want a cup. Yeah, but like I mean, Lundqvist is still playing exceptional. Like he, he might be past his prime a little bit. I still think he has a few more years in him, but he is playing exceptional, and it's gonna suck really bad for whoever doesn't make the second round because both these goalies deserve it uh but their offense uh, you know what Kreider I haven't seen anything of Mr. Chris Kreider I'm I'm happy about it because I'm not a fan of him drilling goalies all the time but uh yeah he hasn't done his usual game uh Nash has played pretty good and Zuccarello and a few of the others they're playing pretty well uh Jasper Fast is playing fast so they've, they've had some guys also stepping up like him. And, of course, the Habs with Radulov, he's been amazing. Yeah, no Shea kidding. Weber's been huh, – sorry? Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, he's really stepped up his game. And it's bothering me because I'm expecting Patches and Galchenyuk to do a little bit more. And I think Patches is trying. Galchenyuk is more in the middle. Uh, but even, like, Shea Weber's playing well, too, for the Habs. So – it's it's the series is very good and yes there hasn't been that many goals but the goals that have been scored like that one hander by Radulov amazing goals Nash has made some great plays too so there's still been some really spectacular goals and opportunities and but the goalies are stepping up as you'd expect yeah uh, who's your number go ahead my number two is uh, yeah. going to be the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Columbus Blue Jackets yeah it's been three one four one. But mm. the Blue Jackets have been playing the Penguins hard. It's just the Penguins have been putting putting away the the puck in the net. So uh, it might be a little biased because I'm a Penguins fan, but mm-hmm. I, I think it's still a really good series. Two really well matched teams that I think the scores are a little little deceiving if you're just looking at box scores. Mm-hmm. Maybe, um, but the Penguins just have too much offensive talent for me to put them high on on how good the series is. They score in abundance with even so few great scoring chances. So that's why it's hard, you know, it's hard for me to say how good the series is when they're doing that. But Columbus seems like they're playing hard. They just, you know, can't beat the Pens, especially keep up with the amount of offense that the Pens are producing. Um, Bobrovsky's still been pretty good, but again, the Penguins are just a lot of deflections, a lot of rebounds, smart plays by the Penguins. They're they're, you know, like I said before, uh, they're finishing on the even the minute opportunities. Um, and, and even, uh, yeah. How about Brian Rust? Yep. Five goals now. Yep. In the series, and, that that's impressive. Rust and Gunsel. Yeah. Um, been carrying I don't our, know. carrying our team. Yeah, these guys are carrying. You'd expect the core, the main guys, but again, the main guys are still playing amazing. I don't know how many points Malkin has had in his career in the playoffs. But he's continuing it this year in the playoffs. And Kessel, he doesn't need to score all the time. He can, he has 
a lot of skill that he can make beautiful passes as well. Did you see that kick pass that he made to, I think it was Gunsel, one of Gunsel's goals in like, game two or something? Yeah. That was beautiful. Yeah. So beautiful. So, yeah, just way too much skill in that series, especially for the Pens. Uh, my number one, and I'm guessing your number one as well, is the Caps and Leafs. That is correct. Go ahead, Paul. You talk about it first. There's, <laughs> going into the series, nobody nobody thought this was going to be a good series. Everybody thought yeah. Washington was just going to come in and blow the doors off of Toronto and teach these young kids a lesson. And these kids are playing so good. Like, yeah. so good. Like, yeah, Mitch Marner has been off, like what Anthony said in our team ISO, but mm-hmm. they're, they're just playing way better than what rookies should be playing in their first playoff matchup. And against the President Trophy team, I think they have the seed of doubt planted in the Capitals. And, man, I I really want to see them go on. I want the Leafs to win so bad. I'm not even a Leafs fan. And not, not because you're a Leafs fan, Peter. Just they they deserve to go to the second round. I know Washington had a great regular season, but Toronto's playing so good. Yeah. I, I think they could have easily had won – any of these games, maybe not so much last game, that brain gaff that they all made, ah, oh, that killer, that was killer, I don't know what Connor Brown was doing with the pass, he passed the right to uh, to him, and then I think it was, yeah, Burkowski, he got up magically because the puck was like on his stick, and then he tried to do something, and then Connor Carrick came in, and he screwed up even more, and then the pass over, and then they scored, and of course... Anderson wasn't ready. Ah, yeah, whatever. Uh, but yes, the series has, has been good. And I'm more surprised at the Leafs defense. I think a lot of people think that the Leafs defense is not very good at all. If anything, maybe one of the worst in the league. But they have really stepped up. And I'm, I was really sad when Polak got injured because he's been playing solid hockey for at least a month and a half. He's been pretty good, and he was pretty good in the first two games, and then he went down. And it's great to have Zaitsev back, but I think they're rushing him a little bit because of the hole, and they don't want to play maybe Marshenko in that. But Gardner has been outstanding; he stepped it up. Riley's played better, and even Hunwick, he's playing more minutes and he's playing better. So the Leafs' defense has surprised me the most, actually. I don't know if they can keep it up in the series, and I think that might be a bit of the, the downfall and. I hope Zaitsev can be back to what he was in the midseason, but it might be tough. But the rookies, again, their first playoff year, uh, they're looking pretty good too. So not just the big three, but even uh, Hyman hustling hard as per usual in the corners, getting that puck to, to Matthews and Nylander. Browns look pretty good. So... Yeah, it's it's exciting to watch. It's really exciting to watch. It's great to see just the Leafs in the playoffs, but they're playing very well. And, oh, man, almost every single game has gone into overtime until the last game. And, it, again, it ended 5-4. It was still a fun game, exciting game, offensive game. So, yeah, this this series has blown me away. Not only just being, yeah, being a Leaf fan, but compared to the other series, it's been exciting. Even the offense from the Capitals – they're, they're exciting to watch as well. They've made some great plays. Anderson's looked very good, except for the last game. So it's been a great series. And and you haven't even mentioned your boy, Kasperi. Oh, that, oh my God, that game where he scored two goals. He's so fast. It seems odd, though, that all these rookies keep on playing pretty good, filling on the fourth line. I thought Shoshnikov was pretty good earlier in the season. And we're like, I'm like, oh, Shoshnikov's pretty good. He might be better than the fourth line guy, but right now he's playing pretty good on the fourth line. Then they get Levo, and Levo's like, oh, Levo's pretty good. He's going to be really good. Maybe they can move him up the lines. And then again, he gets injured, and now they put Kapanen in, and he's playing even better. I'm like, what's going on? Let's just keep on putting a new rookie on the fourth line, and they can just keep on excelling and getting better. And and that that's my what <laughs> that might be their what they do. Like they they yeah. got enough rookies that like Anthony was talking about that they're. They could just keep developing these guys, and they don't have a star guy that's going to look dumb on the fourth line that's in yeah. the prospect cupboard. So they, they can learn the game on the fourth line and not be out-dueled or 
not fit, right? Like, so Kapanen's like Kapanen's playing well so far in that role, and I think for sure maybe next year he'll move up the ladder in the lineup. Uh, but even Lepsik, uh, Brendan Lepsik, that's also playing for the Marlies, and Kirby Reichel, I still believe these two guys can easily get in maybe a top nine role as well. So maybe next year you'll see them filling in on yeah in that fourth line role. You know, with on Martin's line basically, that's his line. So yeah, the Leafs, you know, their future looks great, but right now they're still looking good against the Capitals, and who knows what can still happen? Series is down to the best out of three. So and then and then you got the the Western Conference where they're just not great hockey being played on one half of the ice. It's kind yeah. of disappointing. The Hawks, the Hawks have been awful. Yeah. They, I, I haven't seen any of tonight's game, but they finally showed up in game three and they were pretty good, but still the Predators were better. They weren't at all showing up in the first two games. Um, yeah, just bad hockey. And the, yeah, we already mentioned the Flames and the Ducks. I, you can't expect too much out of the Flames. They're still a fairly young team, but they're still not a top contender at all. And when they're facing a team like the Ducks, who have a physical presence and a veteran presence, and young D that is very good at the same time, um, yeah, they're just overpowering them. And again, their D, I like I mentioned it even in one of my blogs, they're decimated with injuries, right? Yeah. Dupre is injured. Who else is injured? And then Fowler got in, is injured. He's going to be out three to six weeks. Yeah. Um, so you would think, you know, there'd be a lot more room on the back end when you're in the corners against the Ducks. But there still isn't. They have still very good depth, and they're a very good team. So I don't know how far the Ducks are going to go. We'll see what happens if they face the Sharks or the Oilers. But they, they're, like, in good position. So. Yeah, they're they're. D is decimated. They're playing Corbini and Holzer, your boy. Yep. yep. Holzer, as I said, I th- I thought I'd see him in the series. And I don't know if he played every game in the series. I don't think so. I think it was more Montador and stuff. But uh, Shea Theodore, he has looked very good. Oh, he's such a good defenseman. He's going to be a yeah. stud for many, many years. He has looked very good for them. Uh, so uh, who haven't we mentioned so far in terms of series? Minnesota, St. Louis. Um, yeah, St. Louis just looks very good overall. Yeah. And we still haven't seen Tarasenko much. They're covering him. They're doing a good job uh, of covering him. And I was – we're going to talk soon about underrated players. And one of them almost made my list. And that would have been Charlie Coyle because he's good at covering some guys like a Tarasenko and still maybe chipping in on goals. Uh but, yeah, St. Louis just it does seem like they have a little bit more weapons. Adding Sabotka at the last second from the KHL was great for them. Um, but overall, and Jake Allen. He's yeah, just, he's, out, I think, he's out playing Devin Dubnik big time. Yeah, so didn't look too good last game. Maybe there might be a hole in, in the armor for next game. But so far, he's looked amazing. And then uh, on the east side, we didn't talk about the Senators and Bruins. I actually thought this is one of the better series. It's been very close. I expected a little bit more out of maybe Marchand, you know, and Bergeron. I think they still have another gear and they're going to step it up, but might be too little too late. Yeah, and, and they're they're matched up against Eric Carlson, who's just yeah. been – just his game has risen so much more in the playoffs. He's He's incredible. He's so much fun to watch. Oh, my goodness. It would have been – cool to see how amazing Eric Carlson would have been as an, a sniper in the war, in a war, because he makes bullet passes to his forwards to give them three line passes, basically, not yeah, two from, line passes. from his goal line to blue line, like <laughs> just lasers. It's like, holy smokes, kid. Like, how do, how do you see that? <laughs> I don't know, but those are amazing. He, he is a great player. He is outstanding. Oh, and uh, he, he plays a ton of minutes. Uh, the other night they were closing out the game, the the game four. He played a minute yep. forty seven. I don't know the exact numbers, but he played like a minute forty seven. Took a thirty second break because of a timeout, and then played mm-hmm. another two minutes. Yeah, like that's unreal. In the yep. to close out a game to win like that, that that is incredible. Like they they say he's 
going to win the Norris because of his offensive side. Well, he's got some defensive side to his game too. Don't don't you worry about that. Yeah, I'm watching Minnesota games and I'm seeing Suter barely get off the ice. But then you watch Carlson, he's doing the same thing with outstanding offensive skills overall. It's it's he's unbelievable Carlson. Yeah. Just insane. Um I think that's it. I think we mentioned pretty much every team, every series, right? Yes, we did. All right, so let's get into the underrated picks. My number three is the guy I was thinking about picking. Paul, maybe I was I was leaning on either Ryan Kessler or Ricard Raquel, and Raquel's looked very, very good and is still underrated for the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. Mighty Ducks, that's right. So, uh, so you went with Kessler over yes Raquel over Raquel, and I was thinking about Raquel just because he has he's been. Great all season. He has a lot of goals. Uh, but, you know, Kessler, again, he's very gritty and he's usually good in in the playoffs. Uh, but, yeah, Raquel has looked excellent for the Ducks. He's got five there... points. That's not too bad. Yeah, he's looked very good. And, again, the Ducks aren't a big explosive off- offensive team. So five points is very good. Um, who do you have as your number three? Oh, putting me on the spot. I, don't, I didn't do a, a list here. <laughs> oh. All right. If you um, want, I can do mine. I yeah, can, like let me mine. let me let me think about this for a few minutes. <laughs> all right, my number two, Paul. I don't want to put him on my list at all. Do I have to put this guy on my list? Yes, because I know exactly who, and he would be on my top three. I'd probably oh, put him. I'd probably put, put him, him number. I'd probably put him number one right now. Oh, I hate this guy. Just say his name, Paul. I don't want to say his name. Tom Wilson. Oh. So good. So bad. He's so bad. Oh, yeah, he's on my list. Um, Wilson, has, yeah, I said his name wrong. Uh, he's been playing outstanding for the Capitals. Not only a physical force and an agitator, he scored some big goals. Number Game number one, yeah, maybe Anderson could have had it, but it was just an unpredictable, and it was a good shot. It wasn't maybe super fast, but it was right top corner basically oh, he scored that big goal and then he comes out and scores two goals last game oh my goodness yeah he's been good and then my number one I wasn't sure I wanted to pick Clark MacArthur and I think he's been a good story piece for the Senators and he's helped them in that aspect but as well Craig Anderson both of them are my number ones so underrated they're doing such a good job for the Senators, uh, Anderson all season when he's played, and now so far in this playoff series. It's such a beautiful story to hear, uh, an inspiring one for the Senators and their fans and these two guys playing for them. So congratulations uh, for the Senators so far playing so well. And these guys are unheralded for sure. Paul, have you... uh, made a list or are we going to continue i i've got two guys one is tom tom wilson i have to also mention him because yeah he's had an incredible series so far and my other one is bobby ryan this guy was fed to the dogs all regular season he's now got five points three goals big goal last game in game four the game winner i'm saying bobby ryan underrated Mm -hmm. everybody thinks he's there's a lot of mock drafts that have Bobby Ryan going to the expansion draft. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the way he's playing right now, I don't think they're going to let that happen. It's tough. I think he stole my, I was thinking Bobby Ryan, wasn't I, before we started recording? Uh, All right. (laughs) Uh, Okay. Uh, So, and again, we will talk more playoffs, of course, next week, but we will mention, or we will talk about our top three picks at, the current moment, probably after the first round, for MVPs of the first round of the NHL playoffs. So stay tuned for that next week. Paul, what is the Jablam Junior Hockey update? Oh man, there's so much junior hockey going on right now. I could mm-hmm. I could probably do a full episode of just talking about junior hockey. Like there there's so much stuff going on. Uh, let's just start off with the three undefeated teams in the the first two rounds: St. John Sea wow. Dogs eight zero, Charlottetown Islanders eight zero. The Sea Dogs are led by Thomas Shabbat, just playing unreal. 
The Charlottetown Islanders are led by Daniel Sprung and a guy named Philip Chalapic, who is an Ottawa mm-hmm. Senators prospect. So they're they're probably going to lose a game sometime in the third round. Then you got the Peterborough Peets who lost their first game tonight against the Mississauga Steelheads, who are deep. The Steelheads, you look up and down the roster and you're like, yep, I know him, yep, I know him. And when you know the guys, you don't even have to look them up, you don't even have to question who they are. That means it's deep. Like Spencer Watson, 300 points in the OHL. He's he's unbelievable in the O. He's a LA Kings prospect. He leads his team uh, 19 points in 12 games played. And then they got the two Devils prospects, Michael McLeod, who's playing unreal. I think he got two goals tonight. Uh, Mm -hmm. Nathan Bastion, and then they got draft eligible guys like Owen Tippett uh, is draft eligible. Nicholas Hag is draft eligible and staying on the topic of draft eligible guys like Jason Robertson. There's been so many guys that have just been playing lights out in their draft year. Mm -hmm. It's impressive. And then you got like an overager in the WHL, like Tyler Wong, 22 points for Lethbridge, who probably shouldn't be moving on to the third round, but They've played two seven-game series, and basically Tyler Wong's carried them through every single game series. Tyler Wong is the man in Lethbridge right now. Wow. Uh, and then you got the Mem Cup favorites, Regina Pat, Sam Steele, Anaheim Ducks prospect, and Connor Hobbs are just playing lights out. Like I said, Peter, I could just go on for days about <laughs> junior guys. And then the under-18s are, are happening too, so not even playoffs, but under-18 uh, quarterfinals happened today. Canada got beat out by Sweden. Uh, yeah. Russia's won their game in overtime. United States won their game close at the end against Switzerland. Nico Heischer basically kept Sw- Switzerland in the game once again, just like in World Juniors, and he's going number one. He's number one yeah. overall. Yeah, Nolan Patrick, Patrick is dropping. Yeah, he's kind of falling off, and uh, Miro Heiskanen from Finland's kind of moving up. He's a defenseman. He's leading almost leading. I think he's one point back in the, the top 10 scoring at the under 18s, Miro Heiskin and keep him. He, he, he might go to Vancouver this year. if They're picking second or third overall. They, mm-hmm. they might need to fill that Triamkin and Larson role and yeah. Sweden beat Canada. Like I said, seven, three Canada did not show up today. It was, it was brutal. Mm-hmm. Their, their under 18 team did not look very good. Yeah. Which is not not looking so good for World Juniors next year, but everybody's everybody's caught up to us. We we were the team to beat every year at the World Juniors, and now they've yeah. The rest of the leagues have caught up, and the states look good. Uh, it's a, it's not looking good for Team Canada. I'm I'm putting it out that I don't think we're gonna have a good World Juniors next year. Oh, say it ain't so, Paul. Sorry, the goaltending. Our goaltending is is key, and yeah. we're we're not developing like we used to. Where are our French goalies? Come on, guys. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, that's it for this episode. Paul, maybe you want to write a little blog about some of these junior matchups now? I'm maybe? actually going to put one out tonight. So oh. by the time you listen to this, you can see my playoff uh, predictions for the next round. Nice. Perfect. Um, and that's it for this episode, then. Uh, stay tuned. Next episode, we're going to be previewing probably the second round matchups we will be naming some mvps of the first round of the playoffs uh and then of course maybe some other stuff <laughs> that's it for this episode and again please go to jablamhockey.com rate review us if you can on itunes subscribe to us we're also on youtube uh and follow us on twitter at Jablam Hockey or, or paul or myself And check out the game notes while you're listening to the show, especially for the trending now stuff. Some cool stuff, especially that crazy Patrick Kane video. All right, later. Bye.